Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. After making the case with his first argument that love is the most lovely or beautiful, the most callous of all of the gods or divine forces, Agathon is going to make a second argument intended to complement and reinforce this, this other one in his speech. And it's going to make uh, reference to the goodness or the virtue, the arete, the moral excellence of love. So we have love as kalos and we have love as agathos. Putting these two together is very natural for the Greek, the beautiful and the good. Agathon is trying to provide us now with the second half of that. The way he's going to do that is he's going to talk about each of the four what we call cardinal virtues. It's very interesting here that Agathon is going to pick up precisely on the four virtues that Socrates, you know, acting as the mouthpiece for Plato, will talk about in other places. There is a fifth virtue, uh, piety, hosios, which gets um, brought up as well in, in several other dialogues, particularly the Euthyphro, but also the Protagoras. It plays a role in the Republic, but it's not being discussed here in part because it wouldn't re really make sense to, to worry about love as being pious, since love is, at least as far as the assumption goes here, one of the gods. So we're going to talk about justice, dikaiosune, uh, temperance, sophrosune, uh, courage, Andrea, also sometimes rendered as manliness, and wisdom, or sophia, not phronesis, uh, which is you know, practical wisdom, but wisdom in, in general, wisdom in the broadest sense. Plato, by the way, will use both of those terms in many respects um, without distinguishing between them as, as synonyms. So, how is Agathon going to argue that love actually possesses all of these moral virtues and possesses them to the greatest extent. His arguments are not particularly good, but don't be too concerned before we actually see what the argument is about critiquing it immediately. We'll come back and, and critique these after we're done. So, justice, uh, dikaiosune, right? The state of, um, as it's often put, giving everybody what is their due. Um, does love have that? He says that love never injures anyone, so that's one important part. Love is also never injured. Now, why would he bring up love being never injured? Well, when we are injured, that's when we have a tendency to want to retaliate and do, do some injustice in return, right? When we get angry, we often go, go beyond proper bounds. Um, he also says that love is, it doesn't involve force at all, bia, or a compulsion. Um, rather, everybody serves love willingly. Everybody serves love, the Greek for that is heikon, um, you know, assenting to it, agreeing to it. When we, when we do things out of love, we may feel a sense of compulsion, but we also are doing what we want to do. So, he's saying here that because of that, love is not actually compelling anybody to do anything against their will, and so love is in fact just. The, the essence of justice, many of the Greeks felt, lay in these mutual arrangements where they were consensual. One would say, I agree to this, I agree to this. Agreements, as we would call them. So he's saying love actually follows along with that. Love is, is in some respect, the source of that sort of thing. <clears throat> what about temperance? Is love temperate? Here's an interesting argument. Well, what is temperance? At least the way the Greeks understood it, or moderation. It's mastery or rulership, kratia, over pleasures 
and desires or appetites. And love itself is one of those desires or, or pleasures, if you actually get what it is that you're desiring. And so if love is the most powerful of all these, no lesser desire, say the desire for wealth, the desire for food, the desire for reputation, the desire to build a great monument, uh, you know, the desire to have a, a car tricked out in various ways, none of those can actually hold a candle to love. So if you feel love, love is going to result in the mastery of those desires, right? Because if they get in the way of love, um, love takes priority, they take a back seat. Um, so by love being the most powerful, that means that love becomes the master of all of these other pleasures and desires which means that love is like super temperance. It is temperance to the highest degree because what is it to be temperate? It's to rule pleasures and desires. Now notice that love itself is still one of these desires. Courage or manliness, uh, Andrea. Here, in fact, he brings up one of the most manly men or actually manly gods of ancient Greece, a guy who is just out of control. The, the, the guy who, you know, if he was a human being, he'd be getting in barroom fights. And that's Ares, the god of battle, the god of war, the bloodthirsty one. And love, according to the story, takes Ares captive. How so? Because Ares conceives a love or a lust or a desire for the goddess of love, Aphrodite, and it's the force of love which controls Ares in this case. So Ares becomes the, cap becomes the captive, love is the captor. The captor is stronger than the captive, so love is even stronger than the bravest and the strongest, which means that love then has to be even more brave and even stronger than, than, than Ares. So that sort of elevates them to the very top. Sort of like going into uh, you know, a situation with a bunch of tough guys and you pick out the toughest guy there and you beat him up, that means you're the toughest, right? That's the argument that Agathon is making here, essentially. Now, the reason why I put wisdom over here by itself is because uh, Agathon is going to devote more space and uh, more of his, his thought to telling us why love really has wisdom. This is, in a certain sense, a reflection of um, Plato, who tends to give wisdom the highest priority among the virtues as well. So it's kind of an interesting uh, point to follow up on. Why is love wise? Well, here's the central thing. Love actually knows things, because the evidence that you know something is that you can make something happen, or you can teach that thing to somebody else. Love, he says, is, uh, making reference to his own profession, love is a poet. And unlike other poets who can't quite explain what, what they're doing, as we see this in many other Platonic dialogues, love is a poet who can make others who are not poets into poets. Love can do what it is that Plato demands that anybody who really knows something ought to be able to do, he can teach it, he can produce it in another. How does love make the, the rest of us poets? Well, when we fall in love, then we, you know, get all, uh, you know, we start thinking about love songs and poetry and, and doing poetic gestures, we would call those romantic gestures. Uh, we start producing, we start doing things, right? Uh, uh, poiein in Greek is, is a word that means to produce or to do. It's broader than just, you know, sitting down writing verses or stuff like that. Showing up with flowers would be, in a certain sense, a, a type of poetry. Not a very eloquent poetry, unless the flowers are very artfully arranged, but nonetheless, poetry in some sense. So love is able to take people who are not originally poets and turn them into poets. Sort of like, you know, if you want to say that you really understand um, culinary arts, can you turn somebody else into a chef? If you really, really understand construction, can you take some guy off the street and, you know, teach him some, some trades so he can actually build a house? Um, love can do that. Furthermore, living things, everything that we see, including ourselves, and, you know, I mean, the Greeks didn't really think in these terms, but if we wanted to get kind of silly with it, 
you know, all the parasites living on us and the bacteria in us, they're all reproducing. Well, the bacteria aren't reproducing through sex, but everything else pretty much is. So they're all reproducing through love. Even the plants are, right? You know, male, pollen, uh, eggs, fertilization, all that sort of stuff. That's all being produced by love. So love is, you know, in a certain sense, the, the ultimate botanist and zoologist and I don't know what else we want to say, sexologist perhaps. Um, the arts and the sciences, this is even more interesting. All the arts and the sciences, Agathon says, are brought forth by love. And he gives examples of a number of different gods. Hephaestus, the metal worker, um, originally you know, starts to become a smith because he loves the stuff that he's working with. Um, Apollo gets you know, triple credit. He's, he's what we call a triple threat. Uh, archery, medicine, divination. Um, Athena gets weaving, although she should also get strategy from, from this guy, you know, clearly, uh, given that, you know, she plays a role in that. Um, and we can go on and on and on. Presumably Ares really loves uh, hewing people you know, on the battlefield. Um, Zeus loves ruling and introducing order to things. So even the political art is in a certain respect um, produced by love, by the force of love. He observes another thing, too, that's very interesting about these, you know, arts and sciences or crafts. Those who have passion, he says, um, succeed and become famous. Those who don't have that, those for whom, you know, their craft is just a day job, they don't achieve that. We don't really like their work. It's love that allows us to produce the greatest kinds of works that actually draw people's attention, where they say, that's really something. So love possesses wisdom because of all of these factors. Now let's think about these assertions for a moment. Is this a very good argument for, for justice? Never injures? Yeah, I would say if love never does injure anybody, that's, that's probably a good argument for justice, because part of justice is not injuring people, um, not compelling people into things that they don't really want to do. Um, but, you know, love can actually make us do some really dumb stuff. Um, it's not clear that love doesn't make us do things that we don't want to do, at least, um, you know, in, in our own experience. So I don't know that this would hold. I think we could come up with plenty of examples in ancient Greece that would be counterexamples to this. Uh, temperance, um, love itself may master all the other desires, but it is still a raging desire, and if it's the strongest of desires, Plato is going to be rather suspicious of it as a desire and say that unless you know something is governing it, it's going to get us in trouble. Um, so it's not clear that love actually brings about temperance. As a matter of fact, people often go way over the limits when it comes to acts and, and um, you know behavior uh, that's motivated by love. Um, this, this, this whole argument about being able to get the drop on, on Aries for courage, that doesn't really hold. Um, you can easily be uh, a coward and do in the toughest guy who's the most brave, simply being able to, to um, master him or, or capture him doesn't really make you brave. As a matter of fact, it might show, depending on how you do it, your, your own cowardice as, as a result. Um, wisdom. This is an interesting argument over here. Um, is it a strong argument? Is it one that we should, we should buy into? Or is, is it at best sort of allegorical? You know, there are elements of it that do seem quite interesting and that do map onto some of our experience, but just let's take the last one. Is it possible to be motivated by love, to be passionate about your craft, and still to be a failure? It happens all the time. As a matter of fact, unless you actually have knowledge, um, all that passion is probably just setting you up for either failing or being exploited by somebody else. Um, you know, love can, can you know, produce all these things in, in the natural world, but it, it's not necessarily love in the sense that we're talking about here, so there's a bit of equivocation taking place as well. Uh, it's hard to see how something that is purely instinctual like sexual activity among insects actually results in, 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 you know, love the God being wise. So 
None of this really holds up that well when we look at it, but it is, at least on, on a rhetorical level, a really wonderful portion of the speech because he's claiming that love really does possess all of these virtues and he's trying to provide arguments for why that would be the case. <laughs> 